Hey you guys, it's Peter, and welcome to my channel, Peterisms, where I tell stories of my life and just little things that I have learned as I have grown into the person that I am today. And it is 6.03 p.m. and my husband is on his way home, so I thought I would do a little meditation video before uh, he gets here and we figure out what we're going to do for dinner this evening. Is your life that exciting? Oh my lord, who is it? It's Tucker. Hey Tucker, how are you bud? He said, are we doing a review video, Dad? Because I need some uh, I need some special things that come in those special boxes. Okay. Today I have pulled, are you ready? <laughs> How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven meditation books. So I'm going to just randomly go through here. Which one should I read? Tucker, you tell me. Here, he's going to pick it. <laughs> Boo, you want to pick it? Okay, Boo for the Daily Book of Positive Quotations. He's right here. You can't see him, but his nose went right down to the Daily Book of Positive Quotations. So we will start with that. Uh, let's see. February 5th. Parenting. <laughs> this will be great. Why not with my dogs? <laughs> You're probably like, Peter, what do you know about parenting? Okay. Be gentle with the young. Juvenile. We live in a fast-paced, demanding world. We expect a lot from others, and they expect a lot from us. This is fine for the world of adults, but it can be a problem we, uh, for similar high expectations on the children. While it's important to teach children how to behave properly and get along with others and to keep them active and stimulated, we should never forget that they are still children with tender hearts and minds. I sometimes get impatient with children. Today, I will make a special effort to react to them with gentleness rather than impatience. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> That's a great meditation for me while I'm sitting here and he just keeps on going back and forth and back and forth. Don't you, buddy? He said, well... We got to sleep in a little bit extra today, so that was nice. You know, it's interesting in talking about that. I think um, I was very, very blessed. You know, I talk a lot about growing up um, in a chaotic, toxic environment because of my mother's drinking. But if you've watched my vlog recently, one of the things I have um, really tried to focus on is the fact that my mother also, you know, created a very magical environment for me when I was growing up. The problem was is that... Um, it was scary because I never knew what I was walking into, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't know if I was going to walk into Drunk Mom or Magical Mom. And Magical Mom meant, you know, games in the evening, movies, that, you know, she would do things. Like, my mother was so creative as a parent. You know, she would go out of her way to come up with some huge craft that we were going to do, whether it was making homemade Play-Doh or, you know, doing, like, making different colors and putting them in bottles and um, making homemade ornaments. We did that, I mean, almost every Christmas, you know? And then other things that she would do is, like, we would watch a movie on the weekend or movies on the weekend weekend and she would put like get big cho you know chocolate bars like the big ones and then make homemade popcorn and put it in like brown paper bags and then she would crush ice and she would make like a concession stand on the island in the kitchen and then she would give me like monopoly money and I could go through and these were the things that you do with an only child when you're an only parent and um you know she just did such fantastic things but I will say this, you know, I, th that being said, I was often scared because I didn't know what mom I was going to come home to, you know, or was she going to be completely drunk and blacked out or passed out? Um, I will say, thankfully, my mom, you know, like I, other than having to deal with a mother that had severe drinking issues, there was nothing other than that that was abusive in my home environment. So I, you know, for me, it was just a loneliness. Whereas other people that I know, like they dealt with the alcoholism and extreme abuse as well. And that was not my case. I will say this, you know, that like, this was the point that I wanted to make. I was blessed to have two parents that were extremely patient with me. I don't even know where it came from in all honesty, okay? Because if you can imagine a 47 year old that has five YouTube channels, writes books on a daily basis, you know, is out with his friends, driving around. I mean, it's just like, I was that kid too, right? I mean, I was doing puppet shows and you know, I was all over the place. And my parents were just so patient with me, especially my father. You know, my father was just like overwhelmingly patient to me. I think the thing that's important to remember, you know, is that how we raise our children is who they will be as adults. I remember years and years and years ago, and I think about this with my nephews when I see my nephews. Um, and I thought about this with my best friend's son when, you know, he, because I met my best friend when her son was, we, I figured this out in my vlog last night, like between three and four, uh, between four and five or three and four, um, between four and five, because she got sober, I think, when he was three. So, um... You know, like, Toni Morrison did this interview with Oprah years and years and years ago. You can find this. This is on YouTube. If I can find it, I will link it below. But Oprah asked her, like, what's the most important thing about, you know, um, 
uh, parenting and when you see your kids and things like that. If you don't know, Toni Morrison is an award-winning, Pulitzer Prize-winning author, and um, you know she would like go to work all day long, come home, make dinner for her kids. This, this is she's a good example for me when people complain a lot about not being able to get stuff done in their lives, and I always think of her. She's always somebody that inspires me because I saw in this interview one time with her that she talked about the fact that like. She would work all day long, and then she would come home. I think she had three kids, and you know she put dinner on the table. She'd do homework with them, baths, pajamas, get them into bed, and then she would write at like two o'clock in the morning, and then the next day started all over again, right? So when you have a dream and you're driven, that's what you do. You you work that hard to go towards your dream, right? But in this interview, it's like a couple mothers sitting around, and um, Oprah said to Toni Morrison, she said, you know, like, about parenting, and she said, you know, as parents, I think we often see kids with a critical eye. So when they walk in the room, you know, we say, okay, your hair's not combed, or, um, you know, your shoe's not tied, or your pants aren't pulled up. This is probably one of the most important pieces that I've ever heard about parenting in my entire life, okay? And, um... What she said was, it's about looking at them differently. And so when a child walks in a room, what they're looking for is, do your eyes light up? And I think that's what the video is called, your eyes light up or uh, the critical eye or something like that. But it's like when a child looks, walks in a room, they're looking, they're looking to see, does mom or dad or aunt or uncle or grand, you know, uh, grandma or grandpa, are they looking at like, oh, my shirt is wrinkled or my shoe's not tied or I got in trouble. They want to see like when, you, when I come in a room, do my eyes light up? When you think about that as who we are as adults, right? If I have any self-confidence, if I have any value, if I have any sense of self-love, if I have ever believed in myself, which I do, okay? As beaten down as I have been in my life, as hard as I have put myself down in my own life, I know inside that I am a person of love because my parents gave that to me. They, I knew that growing up. I knew my parents loved me because when I walked in a room, their eyes lit up. I can just remember my dad pulling up to pick me up, you know, on days, and he'd just be like, Peter, you know? And I think about that, and I think about at the end of my mom's life, you know, one of my favorite memories of her is when I, and it's like really the memory that comes to mind when people ask me about my mom, is I would come to the door, because this was her condo that she lived in, and she would open the door, and she'd be like, Peter, and she'd give me this huge hug, right? So when I walked in the room, her eyes lit up, even at 35 years old. I think it's important, not just as children, but in how we approach people, you know? When you see people, when you see your husband or wife come in the door at the end of the day, do your eyes light up? Or are you there waiting with a list of things you need to talk about? Or are you pissed about something that happened earlier in the day? When you see your best friend, do your eyes light up? Or are you ready to vent and complain, you know? When you see your grandma, do your eyes light up? Or are you just asking for a favor? You know, I think it's really important for all of us. When you see your supervisor at work in the morning, do your eyes light up? Or are you just sitting there ready to complain and be like, God, I hate this job. Much of how people treat us is about how we treat them, you know? So I think it's a valuable lesson, and this has been a good reminder to me reading this, that when I go into something, you know, like, do your eyes light up? Ask yourself that, and it's not just about parenting, but um, I will tell you this. People ask me all the time, you know, they're like, because I've read all the books, I've done all that kind of stuff, whatever, you know, read all the books. There are fantastic books, and if I can find uh, the one, oh, what is it called? It's by Bob, Barbara Coloroso. She used to be a school teacher, and um, the book is called, like, Kids Can Do It, or something something like that. But she talks about all these fantastic mistakes that she made through the years, okay? And my friend gave me this book years and years and years ago to read um, because it's about value-based consequences. So if you don't know what value-based consequences are, value-based consequences, this is, goes back to when I worked in treatment. Value-based consequences are that the, the punishment should meet the crime, right? So like if your kid is like walking down the street and, or driving down the street and he takes out the neighbor's uh, uh, mailbox, then the responsibility, the consequence should be fixing the mailbox, apologizing to the neighbor, and paying for the mailbox themselves, right? It wouldn't make sense if the consequence is grounding them for a month. It makes no sense, okay? So that's, it should match what's going on, if that makes sense. Well, Barbara Coloroso is somebody that she wrote a lot about this. And I remember listening to the audio tape. This was so funny because I, 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 this was before I listened to a lot of audio tapes. But I listened to this audio tape and she's in there and she's telling these stories. And they're fantastic, right? Because it's just about how to, you know, set boundaries with people and whatever. But it's really about parenting and teaching. And so... Um, uh, and at that point, I was going to a lot of conferences on stuff like that. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this and she's talking about how um, it was this one story about how her daughter, who I think was like 12 or 13 at the time, she wanted to make this cake for their grandma's birthday. And the mom was like, okay, but you know, that's a lot of work. And she's like, no, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. And something happened. It like got down to like 
the hour before or whatever and they didn't have something to make and it got down to like the day and she did, something happened with the cake i can't remember what happened with the cake but so anyway she looked at her and she said um now i know some people are gonna think this is mean but this is like fantastic teaching moment okay and she said what are you gonna do and her daughter was like oh my god i don't know what i'm gonna do now we don't have any cake for grandma and she's like yeah i mean like you're the one that said you're gonna be responsible for the cake and now there's no cake what do you want to do and her daughter was like i don't know and whatever and she said no there's something you can figure out a solution to this let's figure out a solution and so her daughter was like well i don't have time to make another cake and she was like no you don't and she said well, what if we went and bought a cake for grandma? And um, her mom was like, the mom, the Barbara Colorosa, the teacher, was like, that's fine. What are you going to buy the cake with? And she goes, well, I only have enough money for half the cake. What if I pay for half of it and maybe you could pay for the other half and then I'll work it off over the next two weeks? And her mom said, oh, I think that's a pretty good idea. You know, and it's like, that's a teaching moment, right? Like you're allowing that person, that small person, that small adult to come up with a solution on their own, right? You're talking about somebody later that's going to be sitting on a team, you know, whether they're working in some, you know, warehouse or a law firm and they're going to be able to be come up with solution-oriented pro problems on their own. I mean, all of this is, you know, teaching moments. So I'm so thankful that I had parents that allowed me to come up with my own solutions. I still screwed up. Like, I was the biggest screw up in the entire world, you know? But not that everything that I learned was in vain. Back then, there was a lot of things that were very powerful. So anyway, I will link the Barbara Coloroso book below. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Uh... But anyway, it's fantastic. I'll link it below. And then I will also try to find the Toni Morrison video for you guys that are parents out there that want to see that because it's really, really good. Okay. Boo Rapley, you picked a... Come here, honey. He, you picked a good book. He said, I did? Well, I love to read. Who's your favorite? Oh, there's Tucker. He goes, my brother's wearing me out. Who's your favorite writer in the whole world? He said, I like that Winnie the Pooh, Christopher Robin. You do? Who's your favorite character? He said, Eeyore. Eeyore? Okay, let's pick another book. Should we let your brother Tucker pick it out this time? Well, he jumped out, so it's your job. Okay, pick the book. He picked Healing After Loss. I mean, he went right to it. Healing After Loss, Daily Meditations for Watching Through Grief. Or through, Working Through Grief. You ready, Tucker? This is kind of sad because, so, we have all of PP's stuff over there and um, his ashes, and there's pictures up there of Alex and PP, and I'm gonna put a picture up there, and we have another picture that's, the picture that used to be over there that somebody did of him. Um, we have it over there, and we have some other stuff, and so I was just kind of out loud before I did this video. I was like, PP, we miss you today, buddy. It's hard, you know? All right. February 5th. As for inflicting our sorrow on other people, one does not want to go around blathering and crying all the time, but perhaps it is our gift to others to trust them enough to share our feelings with them. It may help them deal with some of their own. Martha Whitmore Hickman. Is she the one that wrote this book? She's the one that wrote this book. The attempt to be brave, to keep a stiff upper lip, and otherwise be controlled and poised in the face of grief is a false god. How are we supposed to feel when our heart is broken? And yet we continue to extol those who do not show their grief in public, who receive condolences as though the occasion were a pleasant Sunday afternoon exchange. She was so brave. I was proud of her. She didn't break down not once, we hear people say. For whose benefit is this ironclad hold on the emotions, for the griever's sake, for the sake of the consolers, who may be fearful of being swept into the grief, unsure of how they will handle it when their time comes? A friend said, if someone cries in front of me, I consider it a gift. I will not further burden myself with false prohibitions about tears. I really like that meditation, and I don't know why I'm getting so moved by it. But I did have a very dear friend of mine that said to me a long time ago, um, we were talking about something I can't even remember, and she just, like, lost it. She completely, like, burst out crying. And um, I went to console her, and she said, you don't have to console me. She was like, um, if, I, if I can't cry about it, it didn't mean anything to me to begin with. I think that's so valuable, you know? I also think the thing that I've learned over time is that not everybody shows pain or joy or with, you know, tears like I do. I'm an easy crier. I cry really easy. But there was a long time that I didn't do that, you know? I talk about this on here all the time. I didn't go, I, there was four years where I wasn't in the rooms of recovery. Before that and during those four years, I was a pretty cold person in my life. Like, I was... Like, emotionally, like, as a kid, people, you, my dad always says, Peter never cried as a kid. He just didn't. He didn't scream. He didn't whine. He just, he wasn't highly emotional. 
I think what happened was that for years and years and years and years and years, I just pushed emotion down, pushed emotion down, pushed emotion down. When I came back in the rooms of recovery and I decided, you know, that at any expense, I'm going to be who I am. Like, I had heard this lead, okay, and this woman was talking about, so a lead is when somebody gets up and they tell their story. And this woman was talking about the fact that, um, you know, like every day she would go to this meeting and this woman would say, like, how are you doing today? And she'd say, oh, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, and she was dying inside. And there are people that are dying in the rooms of recovery every day because they're not being honest with how they truly, truly feel. And um, so, she, you know, for weeks on end, this woman would be like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm fine. And one day she looked at her and the woman looked at her and said, how are you really doing? And she said, I'm not doing very good. And like everything changed for her that day. I don't know why. But I had that moment because I heard that lead and I remember like the next time somebody asked me, I said, I'm not doing very good. Like I'm in a lot of pain, you know? I don't do that today. <laughs> like, God, I've been on the phone with my sponsor or my best friend in the last week. I'm actually doing okay today, you know? I think the other thing is, is if you cry or whatever, people think that you're not doing okay. I'm actually doing pretty okay today. If I wasn't, I probably would be 100% honest and say, I'm not doing okay today. But I'm doing pretty, I'm doing pretty good today. Um, I think it's important for us to live out loud. I think it's important for us to be honest about how we're feeling internally and just find one person that if you're not doing okay to let them know i'm not doing okay today you know um i was like what was this meditation about tucker boo i lost it <laughs> it was about grieving um the whole book's about grieving i want to mention something else in here before i get off from this video tonight i loved both of those meditations um so i started reading a book last night on audible it was a book that I don't even know how I found out about it. I think I was listening to it in something else and it was referenced and then I was like, okay, I want to read this book. And it's about this neuroscientist uh, that worked at Harvard and he had uh, this E. coli meningitis, which like one in 10,000 people get in a year or something. It's just very, very rare. And he was in a coma for seven days. It, his name is Eben Alexander. And um, he... Um, had a near-death experience, which is called NDE. I've been talking a lot about this in my vlogs. So I got this book. It's called Proof of Heaven, and it's by Eben Alexander, and I'm going to make it like the extra credit book for this month. So if you would like to read that on here as well, it is non-religious. I will tell you that. It goes in there, and it talks about all different kinds of religion and science and everything like that. So um, he said it's really for those people that like have always kind of wanted to believe in an afterlife but couldn't get there somehow. Those are the people that he wrote the book for. Um, so... He's so funny. So anyway, I'm gonna make that the extra credit book for the month. I will put link it below if you guys want to check that out. There's gonna be all kinds of things linked below if I remember. So anyway, I love you guys and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.